Could Joshua trees go extinct? It's a distinct possibility. Some estimates say that up to 90% of their habitat could be gone by the year 2100 and could disappear completely within Joshua Tree National Park in that same time. These Joshua trees at the park could indeed be the very last generation you or I ever see at this iconic Mojave Desert Park. Which brings up a sort of existential identity crisis, right? I mean, what would Joshua Tree National Park be without its Joshua trees? That is, of course, complicated, and how you feel about it probably depends on your own relationship with this park, this desert, and these plants. But what's happening here at Joshua Tree National Park, how it could even possibly be in the position to lose its namesake plants in the first place? is simply a microcosm of what's happening to Joshua trees across the Mojave Desert, and indeed, what's happening to the planet more generally. I recently traveled to Joshua Tree to get my eyes on this issue myself, to try and really understand what was happening to this landscape and to these plants, and to try imagining it without Joshua trees. So let me walk you through what's happening here, what threats Joshua trees are facing, how those threats are being addressed, and ultimately, whether or not we can expect to see Joshua trees here in the future. All right, let's first set the scene. Here at Joshua Tree National Park, you've got a really unique desert ecosystem. This park lies at the intersection of the Colorado Desert, which is part of the larger Sonoran Desert, and the Mojave Desert. There's no hard and fast rule for the line between these deserts, and so what you end up with is this incredibly biodiverse transition area where species from both deserts can be found. In the eastern part of the park, you're mostly going to find those Colorado slash Sonoran Desert species. This area really lies below 3,000 feet of elevation and is dominated by creosote bushes interspersed with other iconic species like Acatillo and Choya cactus. For animals, you'll find species like kit foxes, zebra tail lizards, kangaroo rats, western diamondback rattlesnakes, and birds like Lacan's thrasher. Above 3,000 feet of elevation, though, that's when you start to get into that Mojave habitat. You're going to see vegetation like pinyon pine and juniper forests, some scrub oaks, and of course, those iconic Joshua trees. These guys have really specific habitat requirements. You'll really only find them between elevations of 2,000 and 6,000 feet, although even then they really prefer to be in like the upper middle portion of that range. The reason for this is because Joshua trees, despite being a desert species, need slightly cooler temperatures and a little more moisture to reproduce. You can find them all across the Mojave Desert as well, not just here in the National Park. This limited range of habitat is actually one of the reasons the threats they're facing are so existential, which we'll get into in a minute. But Joshua trees are also a keystone species, so pretty much everything relies on them for their survival in one way or another, whether that's through shelter, food, or moisture. For instance, 25 different bird species rely on the Joshua tree for nesting habitat, and loggerhead shrikes, which are these like totally badass birds, actually impale their prey on the sharp spiny leaves of the Joshua tree before they eat them. You'll also find red diamond rattlesnakes, desert spiny lizards, and pinnacate beetles relying on the Joshua tree as well, along with countless other species. They're the foundation for pretty much all life in this desert. And because, remember, this is a food web, all of these ecosystem components are interdependent on one another. So if something happens to the Joshua tree, all of the species that rely on it are in danger as well. For instance, if Joshua trees don't reproduce, which like all indications are right now that they aren't doing that, or at least they're not doing it as well, then they don't produce as many seeds, which means all of the animals that rely on those seeds don't get any food, so there's not as many of them, and then the animals that rely on eating those animals now don't have food, so they die as well. In this way, the whole desert ecosystem is disrupted. 
In fact, since 1960, Mojave Desert bird populations have declined by 43%, and winter ranges for those same birds have shifted northward 19 miles on average. All right, now let's talk about those threats. What threats could be so dire that they're not only threatening the Joshua trees themselves, but the very ecosystem that they're a part of? There are a couple of answers to this question, but first and foremost, let's talk about climate change. Climate change-induced drought has significantly impacted the Joshua Tree in the last few decades. According to the National Park Service, precipitation in Joshua Tree National Park is down 39% since 1899. 60% of the surface water springs went dry in the park in just the 10 years between 2006 and 2016. That may not sound like a lot, but remember this is a desert. Water is already hard to come by, and any significant decrease in the amount of water available to these species could be catastrophic. Also, along with that decrease in rainfall, there has been a corresponding increase in temperature, about 3 degrees Fahrenheit in that same time, again according to the National Park Service. The effect of all these changes has been to basically stop Joshua trees from reproducing. The Joshua trees you see in the park, the iconic ones that give the park its name, are already established. They're mature trees, some of them hundreds of years old, and already have their desert defenses. They know how to deal with things like heat and drought already. Young Joshua trees, on the other hand, in order to get to that point, really need two things to become established. Rain, of course, is one of those things. In the desert, that doesn't come frequently or reliably, and so Joshua trees, like many desert plants, are slow growing and already not quick to reproduce. Throw in even less rain? and that reproduction becomes even less frequent, hence the lack of young Joshua trees we see becoming established in the park and across the Mojave. The other thing they need is, actually, cold temperatures. Joshua trees typically require a hard freeze in the winter to stimulate flowering in the spring. Warmer temperatures, like the ones we're seeing, could mean no flowering. And if you're a flowering plant who doesn't flower, you don't reproduce. Again, this explains the lack of young Joshua trees we are seeing in the park. Climate change then, via decreased precipitation and increased temperatures, is threatening the very thing that species rely on to continue like existing, reproduction. A 2013 study found that Joshua trees are just not reproducing in about half of their range in Joshua Tree National Park. That's why I said that the Joshua trees you see here could indeed be the last of their generation. The last ones you or I ever see here. As conditions continue to warm and continue to dry out, the amount of suitable Joshua Tree habitat is expected to shrink correspondingly. This is that 90% stat I mentioned at the beginning of the video. 90% of Joshua Tree habitat could simply disappear by the end of the century, and potentially all of it could disappear here in Joshua Tree National Park. Essentially, what's happening is they're being forced to higher elevations where conditions are a little more favorable because they're cooler and there's more moisture up there. These higher elevation habitats are known as refugia, a place where Joshua trees can retreat to as lower elevations become less hospitable. This is a problem, though, because Joshua trees already have limited habitat availability, like we talked about earlier. So, if you take away a portion of that already limited range, this has a disproportionate impact on that species' ability to survive. Not only because they have less habitat, like places where they're even capable of growing, but because when you constrict a species to a narrower and narrower range, the species becomes especially vulnerable to catastrophic events, like wildfires. Invasive grasses, such as cheatgrass, are infiltrating Joshua Tree habitat and building up a lot of fuel on the desert floor, so that when a fire does start, it all just goes up like a tinderbox. Joshua trees are not adapted for fires like this and can experience large-scale mortality if one does break out. This is exactly what happened in the Mojave National Preserve just this year with the York Fire, and in 2020, the Sima Dome fire there killed 1.3 million 
Joshua trees. Even worse is the fact that these fires can and do occur in those higher elevation areas, those last strongholds where Joshua trees are supposed to be able to retreat from warmer, drier weather down below, making even the supposed refugia vulnerable for this beleaguered species. Also, it's worth noting here that those Joshua trees killed in the fires were Eastern Joshua trees, Yucca yegarina, which depending on who you ask are either a separate species or subspecies of the Western Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia, which is what we're talking about in this video. Generally speaking, Western Joshua trees are the ones we're most worried about with all of these threats. Eastern Joshua trees aren't thought to be as vulnerable, but taxonomical differences aside, catastrophic wildfires are still a major threat to Western Joshua trees. And because half of the Western Joshua trees habitat is still on private, unprotected land, they have to contend with development pressures as well on top of all these climate threats they're already facing. So of course, we're talking about housing and like commercial developments, yes, but surprisingly enough, a major threat to Joshua trees in this realm comes from the renewable energy industry, whose large solar and wind arrays threaten to displace and remove Joshua trees as well. These industries claim that in order to save the Joshua tree, we have to transition to 100% clean renewable energy as quickly as possible so that more Joshua tree habitat remains shielded from the threats of climate change. Which like this is correct and I agree, but I find their logic a little dubious considering uprooting them and destroying their habitat today isn't going to do them any good if they're not around to see their habitat saved for the future. Uh, more resources and perspectives on that in the description if you're interested. All right, so let's bring this whole thing home. Joshua trees clearly are under assault a full-on bombardment from all sides that threatens the very survival of this iconic species. Climate change is shrinking their habitat and destroying their ability to reproduce. Invasive species are making them more susceptible to fires, and private development directly threatens their habitat as well as the trees themselves. It's a bleak outlook, I admit. Things just don't look good for the Joshua tree at this moment. Historical trends and future projections do indeed paint a bleak picture for these Mojave icons. But it doesn't mean nothing is being done. For years, activists have attempted to have Joshua trees listed as an endangered species, both on a federal level and by the state of California, which has its own Endangered Species Act. Both of those efforts failed, but the state of California actually just this year passed the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act. While stopping short of listing Joshua trees as an endangered species, the act does put protections in place for Joshua trees for the very first time by making unpermitted removal of them illegal, setting up a fund for the acquisition and conservation of their habitat, and requiring a species conservation plan be drafted by the end of next year. This law is really focused on the land use challenges that Joshua trees are facing, and it puts a legal framework in place for the species survival. I also read of several instances where Joshua trees are being revegetated in some of those more resilient and higher elevations, but desert restoration is notoriously difficult, and the results of these attempts remain inconclusive for the moment. We'll have to see how this all plays out in the future or info in the description if you're interested. And in terms of those climate change threats and what can be done about them, really, we all know the answer to this one. Reducing emissions ASAP. If Joshua Tree habitat is shrinking due to increasing temperatures, then reducing emissions and stopping that warming is the best way to ensure their habitat remains viable well into the future. The scale of this problem goes beyond Joshua trees though, and beyond the scope of this video even. It's a global problem which requires a global solution. Joshua trees are simply one of the many victims here. Which brings us back to the question I posed at the beginning of this video. What happens to Joshua Tree National Park if it doesn't have its Joshua trees? Parks like Glacier and Sequoia are grappling with these same questions and remind us that national parks are on the front lines of the fight against climate change. Iconic species and iconic landscapes, places that we love and care deeply about, 
I love and care deeply about, I mean, look at this channel, are at risk of losing the very things that make them special. The very things that inspired their preservation in the first place. Sure, Joshua Tree National Park will still be here. You'll still be able to come and see the Mojave Desert, do some rock climbing, maybe gaze at the stars. You'll still be able to visit Joshua Tree National Park. But will it really still be Joshua Tree National Park? That's an entirely different question. And for me, I think the answer is no. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Joshua trees are an iconic species, and they're in real danger at the moment. And I know a lot of people have a very special relationship with them, so do be sure to leave a comment down below letting me know how you feel about all of this. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.